All right, so uh, the first thing I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, paper tip. Okay. So um, this is going to be in three parts. So the first thing you're going to do is an annotated bibliography. Okay. Have you ever done an annotated bibliography before? No. If I have, I don't remember doing one. Okay. Okay. Do, do, do you know what it is? Um, I do, but I can't like. <laughs> okay. Right this second no. Okay. So yeah. so essentially, what you're going to do before you even start writing any part of the paper, uh -huh. you're going to find uh, no fewer than five and no more than seven secondary sources. Okay. And you're gonna give me essentially like, like a bibliography or works cited page, mm -hmm. but with each citation, you're also going to give me a paragraph describing that source, right? It should be about five sentences long. You're gonna give me the basic argument the source is making. Tell me what the author's credentials are so that we know this is someone who actually has expertise mm -hmm. in this subject and you're gonna explain how you're gonna use this in your paper. Okay. So um, that's gonna be the first thing that's gonna be due. Because I want you to do the research before you really come up with a thesis or start. Okay. Um, um, then you're gonna do a 500 word proposal, which will be much like the proposal, yeah, the proposal you did for the um, But we are thing. citing for the um, you don't have to cite sources in the proposal. In fact, you probably shouldn't because you've only got 500 words. Right. So um, what you want to do is make sure that you're highlighting your own argument there. Okay. And you know that's mostly just so that I can see if you're on the right track or not right. before you get too deep in the weeds with the paper. Right. Um, and then you know, the paper itself, you're going to choose two texts to analyze, right, okay. from different historical periods. Okay. Um, and they're going to have, they're going to need to focus on the same, uh, essentially what you're going to do is find a theme that they both share, right? And compare and contrast the way they treat that theme. So I could either do industrialization and Victorian romantic or... Yeah, you, you, um, yeah, you, you, you could do something like that, Victorian, right? Victorian or Victorian and then... Contemporary or, and yeah. World War. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you could absolutely do yeah, that. They don't, they don't necessarily have to come from like the same unit of the class, right? So if you're talking about industrialism or industrialization, right? Um, you can use a text that we didn't talk about in one of the industrialization sessions. Okay. Um, just make sure that both of the texts are from different historical periods, right? Okay. Um, and yeah, um, so what you're going to do is yeah, compare and contrast the text and make an argument about like kind of what the key difference or similarity you detect is and why that matters. Um, so let's see. Um, so uh, go ahead, take a minute and look over the assignment sheet and ask me if you have, like if you have any questions as you're looking at this, ask me. Um, I will talk. I'll give you a sample annotated bibliography before you before it like before it's due, okay. um, and we'll talk about where and how to find sources okay. um, before you do that. But yeah, that, that is going to be due on the first of December, so about a month from today. Okay, and then this, so this is after the final, right? Like the official is after. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the the paper will be due after the final. Okay, right? I knew that. I was trying yeah. to remember the. Yeah, the final paper is due on the 14th. The proposal is due on the 8th. Okay. Yeah, and I'm also I'm happy to look over uh, draft. Like if you want to you know, email me or come to the office and show me a draft, I'm okay. happy to look that over for you okay. um, at any stage. And you also get extra credit for going to the writing center, right. so don't don't forget about that. Okay. So just yeah, take a minute and see if you have any questions. Um, one thing that I do want to quickly note, um, I do not want to hear anybody complaining that they can't find sources, because what do I give you at the beginning of just about every right. class period? Yep. So yeah, you can, you can certainly use those as a starting point. Right. And then one of the best things to do, actually, once you have a couple of sources already, is work backwards from them, right? Look at the end of the article, or in the footnotes, see what sources they used, okay. and try and find those as well. And that, that should get you to five sources pretty easily. Yeah, I was going to ask if Galileo is a good idea to go for. 
Yeah, um, in fact, there are actually, there are two kind of more specific focus databases in Galileo I'm gonna show y'all. Okay. Um, that'll get you better results. Yeah, I always get confused on Galileo. Yeah, because Galileo, like when you just type in the Galileo search bar, it searches everything in every database, whether yeah. it's relevant or not, so you get a lot of noise. Um, so yeah, what I will show you, um, JSTOR and the MLA International Bibliography, which are, but like, you can organize JSTOR to search only for literature stuff, and um, the MLA Bibliography is Modern Language Association, that is pretty much all language literature stuff, so um, you'll, get, you'll get results that are more relevant. Okay. Well, should any questions develop, yeah. you know how to get in touch with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then, I guess let's let's talk about Victorian women. Okay. Um, so uh, how does how this go for you? Would you? Do you have any thoughts before uh, before I, I get started? I've been I've read so much today. <laughs> <laughs> It was, so the ones for today were uh -huh. more, like, she was critical, her, no, she was saying, I couldn't really tell if she okay. was critical of how she was, like, domesticated, or <laughs> okay. if she enjoyed. Okay, so you're talking about, the, like, the Sarah Stickney Ellis yes. piece. Okay. Yeah, okay, so let's. Let's actually go through this uh, because Ellis is on the one hand pretty early in the Victorian period. She publishes this book in 1839. Um, and it's also uh, pretty widely influential, right? This was, uh, like, Ellis's book was a kind of manual for housewives um, throughout the Victorian period. So let's look first at what she says about men here under, you know, the, on, on page 656, right? And what she believes sort of men's sphere of influence to be. Um, so can you read that for us? To men belongs the potent. To men belongs the potent. I had almost said the potent. Um, to men belongs the potent. Mm -hmm. Consideration of worldly Aggrandizement. Uh, aggrandizement. <laughs> and it is constantly misleading their steps, closing their ears against the voice of conscience, and beguiling them with the promise of peace, where peace was never found. Okay, so yeah, so let's think here about like what she's saying here about men. Well, Omni is all knowing. Right? Uh huh. Um, Omnip. Um, yeah, omni simply means everything, right? So if someone is omniscient, omniscient. that means they're all knowing. Omnipotent, right? Potent means powerful, right? Okay. So someone who's omnipotent or something that's omnipotent is all powerful. Okay. So what is she saying here is kind of men's sphere of operation and influence? Yeah, that there is something is something leads them astray, right? So what Ellis is actually pointing to is a fairly ancient um, gendered division of 
labor and influence, right? That dates back at the very least to ancient Greece, right? So in Greek, the word for household was oikos, right? Which you may know uh, today as the brand of Greek yogurt that is favored by John Stamos. And in Latin, it was domus. But in both cultures, it looks more or less the same, right? So the way the oikos is divided, right, is that the man occupies the outward facing parts of the house. And his sphere of influence is out in the world, in the public, right? The public sphere. While the woman's sphere is the inward facing or more private part of the house, right? Like the hearth. So men operate out in the world, women operate within the home. And so I think you were starting to get at like what Ellis regards as the influence of doing this work out in the world on men. What happens to them as a result? What happens to men as a result of having to be out in the world and seeking worldly things? And, oh, they're misled. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? They are, yeah, they, they are forced to wander down morally iffy paths, right? That conscience might defy. Now, if we continue on to the next paragraph here, right, this starts to explain the woman's role in the home, right, as Ellis envisions it. How often has man returned to his home with a mind confused by the many voices which in the march, the exchange, or the public assembly have addressed themselves to his inborn selfishness or his worldly pride, right? So she describes man as being naturally selfish and proud. And while his integrity was shaken, and his resolution gave way beneath the pressure of apparent necessity, or the insidious pretenses of expediency, he has stood corrected before the clear eye of woman, as it looked directly to the naked truth, and detected the lurking evil of the specious act he was about to commit. Nay, so potent may have become this secret influence, that he may have borne it about with him like a kind of second conscience, for mental reference and spiritual counsel, in moments of trial, and when the snares of the world were around him, and temptations from within and without have bribed over the witness in his own bosom, he has thought of the humble monitress who sat alone, guarding the fireside comforts of his distant home. And the remembrance of her character, clothed in moral beauty, has scattered the clouds before his mental vision, and sent him back to that beloved home, a wiser and a better man. So what is this saying about women? So man is naturally selfish and easily led astray by being out in the world, right? What function does does what what function do uh, <laughs> what function does does a woman serve then? To stay home. Okay, yeah, she stays in the home, right? right. Yeah. Okay. So she's, she just waits. She sits and waits for him. Yeah. And also provides a moral example. Uh, right? okay, the more, okay. Yeah, the whole idea of being the second conscience here, right? Mm -hmm. So this is actually in the Victorian period. Um, believe it or not, a new kind of misogyny, right? So if we look, for example, at like the way the Greeks regarded women, right? Men were regarded as intellectually and spiritually superior to women. 
right? The women were considered dumb, flighty, hysterical, and constantly horny. That was the basic idea of um, the, the basic Greek stereotype of what womanhood, right? Where men were logical and uh, reasonable and <clears throat> intelligent. Now, if we look at the way um, the early church and the medieval church portray woman, right? Eve is both the mother of mankind and the person who brought sin into the world, right? So the basic idea that medieval Christianity um, promotes is that woman is wicked and fickle and not to be trusted. So this is a complete reverse of that, right? On the one hand, the Victorian woman is not regarded as her man's intellectual equal. But she is regarded as his moral better. But her existence is still really only to serve him, right? Yes. She provides. What's that? You can't change everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's it's a more subtle sexism, right? Mm -hmm. But she still exists, really, only to provide a good example to him, right? This is her main purpose: to keep his home, so that he has a refuge from the uh, the hardness of the world, right? Now, to further develop this idea. Um, one of the reasons that this changes in this period is due to Victoria herself, right? You have a queen sitting on the British throne, and I'm going to show you um, a portrait from early in Victoria's reign um, that kind of demonstrates the like what her public image, what her was, what her, what her public persona was. So most portraits from early in Queen Victoria's reign are family portraits, not personal portraits. So here's Victoria. Here's her husband, Prince Albert. There's one of their children and a whole bunch of family dogs, right? Now, who's the central figure in this portrait? Most definitely. Yeah, technically she outranks him. Yeah. Right? She's the queen. He's just a prince. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. She's standing up and yeah. he's sitting down. Which, I mean, is her husband, so that's yeah. true, but still. Sure. But we also, like, and we only... a portrait. I mean, you wouldn't think that they would do that in a portrait. Yeah, especially in our royal portrait, right? right? But yeah, we have, like, like, this is incredibly common in the early Victorian period, right? She's almost never portrayed, like, after her marriage, before Albert's death, she is almost never portrayed alone. She is almost always portrayed in a family scene. And again, one would like see we only see her in profile. And she's looking at him. But we see his, you know, he's he's the one facing outward, right? Facing front. Because the man faces the world, right? The woman faces inward toward the family. And yet yeah, most, um, most ports of them follow this basic pattern, right? You know, loving and doting wife and mother, stern but gentle father, and yeah, child playing at, child or children playing at their feet, right? They had a bunch of children. So the image that Victoria herself ends up consciously or unconsciously trying to promote uh, comes to be called the angel in the house. Right, after the poem by Coventry Patmore that I had you read a part of, right? Mm -hmm. So Patmore's poem is um, 
a kind of tone-deaf, backhanded compliment to his first wife, um, whom he regards or regarded as just, you know, just this sort of angel, right? And the, uh, <clears throat> the poem itself depicts almost exactly the kind of feminine ideal that Sarah Stickney Ellis writes about, right? So one more thing I want to pull out from Ellis here is her definition of what she calls disinterested kindness, because this is kind of at the center of the whole ideology of the angel in the house. So can we turn to page uh, four, 658? And would you mind reading for us the two paragraphs kind of in the middle of the page that start with, in order to ascertain what kind of education? In order to ascertain what kind of education is most effective in making woman what she ought to be, the best method is to inquire into the character, station, and peculiar duties of woman throughout the largest portion of her earthly career, and then ask for what she is most valued, admired, and beloved. Keep going. In answer to this, I have little hesitation in saying, for her dis disinterested kindness, look at all the her her heroines, whether of romance or reality, and all the female characters that are held up to universal admiration at all who have gone down to honored graves, almost the tears and lamentations of their survivors. Have these been the learned and uh, have these been the learned, the accomplished women, the women who could solve problems, the elucidate system of philosophy? No. Or if they have they have also been women who were dignified with the majesty of moral greatness. Okay, so what is she saying here about the way women should be educated? What should what should be encouraged in women women's or girls' education? Heroism. Okay, <laughs> and how how does she seem to be different? Like, what kind of heroism is she interested in here? Let me put it to you this way. Does she seem to think that women should be smart? No. I mean, universal admiration at all people. No. <laughs> yeah. I thought she, not, but I just couldn't give it. Yeah, she said, like, the most admired women in history, right, the great heroines, um, are not the smart women. The, yeah. <laughs> they, now, you know, she, she never uh, seems to stop to consider that this might be because of kind of, like, lack of opportunity for women, right, you know, not, <laughs> um, or you know, because of, like, the, the, the social role that they are assigned, right? Um, but yeah, she argues it without actually providing any specific examples, right? Right. That the women who are most, who are most beloved and most well-known to history are those that exhibit some kind of moral greatness, right? Well, you know, she's not all that wrong. Yeah. I mean, we think like that about it. <laughs> yeah, and I, but I, I think like... But I think that um, mm -hmm. Mary... Wollstonecraft would be pretty pissed about it. Yeah, Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft would not have much, she would have many things to say to Sarah Stickney Ellis had she lived this long. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, she, she would, yeah, she would not have appreciated this particular argument, right? That it's better for women to be good than to be intelligent, right? And I think part of the problem that Wollstonecraft might have with this argument is the reason why Ellis thinks it's more important for women to be good than to be smart. Who does Ellis think that 
a woman ultimately needs to please. Let's uh, actually, I think we can figure some of this out by looking at the next paragraph here, right? Let us single out from any particular seminary a child who has been there from the years of 10 to 15 and reckon, if it can be reckoned, the pains that have been spent in making that child proficient in Latin. Have the same pains been spent in making her disinterestedly kind? And yet what man is there in existence who would not rather his wife should be free from selfishness than be able to read Virgil without the use of a dictionary? So what does she seem to think the women's a woman's education should be geared towards? Who, who, should, who should she aim to please? And who should she learn to please? Well, I would say her child, but is it just her husband? Yeah, that's the essential argument here, right? And disinterested kindness essentially means, right, Kindness without expectation of any kind of personal reward, which, you know, one might argue is, you know, an admirable quality in anybody, right? The problem with Ellis is that she's only expecting it of women, right? And she seems to be willing to allow men to be as selfish as they want. Whereas it's the woman's role to present a model of unselfishness to her husband, right? So disinterested kindness ends up being a kind of selflessness, right? That a woman who asserts herself, Ellis would argue, is a bad thing and a lousy wife. Because then she's being selfish, which is the husband's prerogative. Now, <clears throat> the extent to which the angel in the house exists in reality is debatable, right? This is pretty much, as far as we know, a literary and artistic construct. But the angel in the house, because this figure is so pervasive in literature and art, then becomes an ideal that a lot of families aspire to, right? Especially because a lot of middle class families aspire to be more like the royal family, right? They become a model to be imitated, much as though, you know, the angel in the house's moral goodness is supposed to be something for her husband to imitate, right? Even if she's not that smart. Now, the other side of this particular poll, and as far as we know, equally fictional, is what's called the fallen woman. Now, can we guess from the name fallen woman what we mean here? Particularly if we're thinking of her as the opposite of the angel in the house. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's, that, that's actually a, good, a good reference. Yeah, the idea of kind of fallen angel, right? An angel who couldn't quite uh, keep up appearances, right? So yeah, the fallen woman in Victorian art and literature is a woman who has committed some kind of sexual impropriety. Right? Maybe she's a married woman who had an affair, right? Or maybe she's a single woman who allowed herself to be seduced and had a child out of wedlock or something like that, right? And while the angel in the house is placed up on a pedestal um, and, you know, worshipped and not allowed to be tarnished by the things of this world, right? The fallen woman has fallen off that pedestal and is to be shunned by people of good character. And I'm going to put good in quotation marks here. Because by people of good character, 
We mostly mean a bunch of judgy bastards. And I think that the other thing that needs to be stated here, right, is that the angel in the house and the fallen woman are both, in addition to being literary and artistic constructs, they're also very middle class constructs, right? The upper classes are much less concerned with respectability than the middle classes are. And the working classes don't have time to worry about this shit because they're just, you know, they're, they're too busy trying to scrape together enough for rent and food, right? So this is very much a middle class gender ideology. So <clears throat> I'd like to have a look at the, uh, the essay entitled The Great Social Evil for what this tells us about kind of the fallen woman trope, right? So this is a letter um, that published, that was published in the Times of London in 1858. In response to a letter signed, one more unfortunate. Now, the writer of the original letter, one more unfortunate, claimed to be a governess from a respectable middle class family who had uh, been seduced by her employer, left pregnant, and then forced into a life of prostitution when she was afterwards shunned, right? So, after the one more unfortunate letter appears in the Times of London, another letter appears in response, claiming that one more unfortunate story sounds like bullshit. Because, as the writer of the second letter argues, there are very, very few prostitutes who come from the middle classes. And she claims herself to be a working prostitute who has, um, you know, who gives, you know, because of the details of her origins and of her present life and how they differ, right? So, um, did you get a chance to look this over and uh, to um, come to any conclusions about this particular letter? Like, was there anything that struck, that particularly struck you in it? I mean, she, mm -hmm. she just had to go down that path because, but did, I couldn't tell if it was because, like, she was possibly raped or because, like, she just needed money. Like, because the, uh -huh. when it was talking about her virtue, I was a little confused because she said yeah. she never had it. Yeah. Well, I, I think, like, what she's playing on there is that, Typical, the typical Victorian meaning of virtue, right? So what do we usually think of as virtue? Like, what does virtue mean to us? That's what she means by it here, right? Yeah, virtue is, yeah, virginity or chastity. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she is playing here on the meaning of a word that essentially just sort of means, in general, like goodness or good qualities, right? But that has acquired this more narrow, specific meaning of virginity or chastity, right? Yeah. So what she's arguing is that, like, you know, she, you know, she and her family and her peers were, you know, so busy trying to feed themselves, they really didn't have any time to worry about virtue or about morality, right? So, you know, like, why, why, you know, why would you say that, you know, my virtue was taken when I never had any to begin with, right? Yeah, so that's the, the basic argument that she's making, right? And the other thing to note here is that from her perspective, as a poor child in a family of brickmakers, right, the only well-dressed, happy people she ever sees are 
of prostitutes. Right? So, you know, she's noting, you know, like, this was, you know, the childhood example to me, right? This was how you got ahead in the world. Yeah. You know, it certainly wasn't by sitting in the ditch making bricks. <laughs> right? Um, if we look on pages uh, 666 and 667, right? She says, I was a very pretty child and had a sweet voice. Of course, I used to sing. Most London boys and girls of the lower classes sing. My face is my fortune, kind sir, she said, was the ditty on which I bestowed most pains, and my father and mother would wink knowingly as I sang it. The latter would also tell me how pretty she was when young, and how she sang, and what a fool she had been, and how well she might have done had she been wise. What's the suggestion here about what the mother is communicating? Yeah, that she shouldn't have married this jerk brickmaker, right? And continued living in this hovel in the London slums, right? What but you know, because she was pretty and might have done better had she been wise. She what, could have made her own money. She could have made her own money, yeah, exactly. She could have gone down the path that her daughter ultimately does, right? And when the parents are winking knowingly at each other. Right? It's because they already have some sense of the path that their daughter's on, right? Which, again, like seems morally warped to us, right? But to people who are just scraping by, right? For their, you know, for their daughter, this actually seems to mean a better life, right? Frequently, we had quite a stir in our colony. Some young lady who had quitted the paternal restraints, or perhaps been started off, none knew whither or how, to seek her fortune, would reappear among us with a profusion of ribbons, fine clothes, and lots of cash. Visiting the neighbors, treating indiscriminately, was the order of the day on such occasions, without any more definite information of the means by which the dazzling transformation had been effected, than could be conveyed by knowing winks in the words luck and friends. Then she would disappear and leave us in our dirt, penury, and obscurity. You cannot conceive, sir, how our young ambition was stirred by these visitations. And, you know, I mean, again, like, think about it from this little girl's perspective, right? She could either, um, you know, ruin her health and her looks and probably end up in an early grave and a bad marriage if she stays in the brick pits. Or she could go off, so she could follow this glamorous stranger and go off and make money and have pretty clothes at the very least, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> at least on the surface, which one of those things sounds better, right? Yeah. Particularly when you don't have a lot of other good options. So I think, like, the big thrust of this letter, right? is about how the majority of London prostitutes were forced, you know, were brought into it, not because they were shunned by society, but because they were poor. And this was apparently to them the best shot at getting out of that condition. And a lot of what the letter is, is a kind of, you know, veiled argument for making more provision for the poor. You, Reverend Mr. Philanthropist, what call you virtue? Is it not the principle, the essence, which keeps watch and ward over the conduct, the substance, the materiality? No such principle ever kept watch and ward over me. And I repeat that I never lost that which I never had, my virtue. According to my own ideas of the time, I only extended my rightful enjoyments. Opportunity was not, not long wanting to put my newly acquired knowledge to profitable use. In the commencement of my 15th year, one of our beribboned visitors took me off and introduced me to the great world, and thus commenced my career as what you better classes call a prostitute. I cannot say that I felt any other shame than the bashfulness of a novitiate in introduced to a strange society. Remarkable for good looks, and no less so for good temper, I gained money, dressed gaily, and soon agreeably astonished my parents and old neighbors by making a descent upon them. So she completes the circle there, right? She becomes, 
you know, the glamorous um, daughter of the neighborhood coming back and treating everybody thing and giving things and giving everybody the knowing winks and all that, right? Now, when she talks about Reverend Mr. Philanthropist as well, this is very much a class-based discourse. What's a philanthropist? Okay, so a philanthropist is essentially like somebody who gives a lot of money or time to various causes, right? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, a donor, right? If you are giving your money and your time to causes, what does that suggest about you? Yeah, that you have plenty of both to give, right? So yeah, philanthropists usually are at the very least of the upper middle class. And what she's pointing out is like, you know, you, Reverend Mister, has always had enough to eat. Um, you know, morals and virtue are all very fine for you, right? But you can't eat them. <laughs> they don't make you any money. They're fine for those who travel in these upper class circles, but the poor can't afford them. So you know, this is something, a, a common argument we're going to see. We're going to see this particular argument in debates over slavery as well, um, you know, where um, the interests of the working classes and the interests of the upper classes are kind of directly opposed. And are often, um, it often seems that the upper classes completely misunderstand. Uh, because they're kind of reading their own values onto the working classes. I would argue that this is actually a big problem that we have in our politics today as well. And that one of the reasons why Democrats don't win more elections um, is because they've got a yuppie problem. You know, basically been kind of taken over by the college educated and have a hard time um, communicating with or understanding the concerns of uh, working people. Mm -hmm. Even as they often, you know, like, I think they're often more sympathetic the needs of working people, but I don't think they always understand them. Right. I agree. Sympathetic to an extent. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, as much as you can be, but you don't understand them. Yeah, yeah. So, anywho. <laughs> yeah, that's... Some of the world's problems. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, essentially, if the whole letter is a shot at, you know, quote-unquote, respectable people who look down on her. Um, and treat her as one of these fallen people who is to be shunned when she's like, look, like I make my own money, um, you know, I do what I choose to do, um, I don't, um, you know, make myself a nuisance in public, right, you know, I, you know, apart from this one thing, I follow the law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what, yeah, what business is it, is, it, is it of yours how I make my money, right? And, you know, her money she, is just as good in most shops, um, if not better than um, the money of her social betters, right? So the reason why I wanted to sort of pull out these two particular poles of, you know, female stereotyping and experience in the Victorian period are that, like, this is essentially going to be the kind of thing that um, Goblin Market, which we're reading for next time, uh, revolves around. Um, this kind of this push and pull between the absolutely virtuous woman and the absolutely depraved woman. Um, and what Rossetti is going to do is actually kind of give us a different way, for, like kind of a, like a way forward from this, right? That you don't actually have to think of women as this kind of binary, right, where they're either angel or demon. Mm -hmm. um, that, <clears throat> in fact, um, 
the situation is much more complicated and it's better to be compassionate to those who have fallen than um, to simply shun them. Mm -hmm. you know, someone who has fallen is not necessarily completely irredeemable. So, I mean, do you have any questions about any of this stuff? I mean, since it's, since it's just you, and I know that you, are, you and I are both exhausted. <laughs> no, I really don't. Um, I, I actually did, uh, like, even with that um, Sarah Stickney, uh -huh. I did actually get that. Like, that was what I picked up. But yeah. I couldn't decide which one I wanted to say because I usually am wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Because I try to go for the opposite uh -huh. of what I really think. <laughs> well, well, and, 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 and so here's the like, way I said: just, just say what you really think, because the worst thing I'm going to do is gently correct yeah. you, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, but it's just that. I, yeah. I know that usually I guess completely. My my take on it is completely opposite. It's just the exact opposite. So I was trying to go for both and see what's uh -huh. going right. But see, see, and then this is like, like I think you know this. This shows you know that you're you know I'm the, getting the it. The penny's starting to drop here, right? You're getting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> your your instincts were correct. Yeah. This time it was correct. I'm yeah. proud. <laughs> but yeah, the the big things to try to carry forth next time, right, are the the angel in the house thing and the fallen woman thing. And yeah, so let me call up the reading questions for next time for Goblin Market. Um, I'll let you take those down, um, and then I can let you go.